morning. This is CESA's second annual Climate Change Week series of events. I'm Tina Smith. I'm from the APR program. I'm in stewardship. So if you have an APR or work on APR land, I'm your point of contact. I cover some of Hampshire County and Southern Berkshire County. Um, we've got a lot of great MDAR staff here today. We have Winton Pitkoff, our assistant commissioner, Rebecca Davidson, our director of climate and equity, Jill Bannock, who's our newest stewardship staff member. She's formerly a farmer. I, I don't know if I should say formerly, but she came to us <laughs> as being a farmer. Um, we have Tyler Maycath, um, who serves uh, Hamden County. We have Nathan Moyer, who we'll hear from shortly. And uh, that, I think that is everyone from MDAR. So Jerry. Jerry Polano, yes, yeah, sorry, you should have late. Um, Jerry Polano, we'll probably be putting him on the spot. He is our energy guru. I'm gonna pass it over to Sonia Schloman um, from CISA to talk a little bit about CISA. And I'm gonna introduce our other people um, here today. But a big thank you for, to the Food Bank Farm for having us out for this event. And thank you to Alex from the town of Hadley um, who films events in Hadley as part of their public uh, media department. So I'll pass it over to Shine very great. briefly. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, I just want to welcome everyone here. Um, I'm standing in for Stephen Toronto, who's our climate change uh, person on staff at CESA. Um, and I want to just uh, give a shout out to all of the folks that helped team up in sort of a uh, cross-pollinating spirit to come up with all of the different events that are happening this week for climate change and farming week. Um, it's really exciting to see all the different things that everyone is doing and getting to, to talk with folks and, and hear about some ideas and uh, share information um, with everyone. Uh, just a quick word about CESA. Um, CESA stands for Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture. We do a lot of different things in support of farming uh, that includes the uh, climate change work. We, we like to work in technical assistance um, for farms as well and business related work usually, but not exclusively. Um, and we're just a good point of contact and I encourage folks to uh, get in touch with us even if it's not an area that we particularly can directly work with you on a, uh, solving a problem or exploring an idea or any other aspect of farming that you might want to reach out to us about, chances are we know somebody who can help. So we just would like to welcome you and encourage you to be in touch if you need any help from us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we also have with us Andrew Morehouse, who is the director of the Food Bank Farm. Um, we, Andrew and I are going to talk about how this land came to be APR land. Um, then we're going to talk about the stewardship and monitoring of APR land. We're going to talk about NRCS grants that the Food Bank Farm has received, and so we're very lucky to have with us Diego, who is formerly um, of MDAR and now works with AFT and USCA, and he's going to talk more about what um, those two entities have done here and how you might access those resources for yourself. We're going to talk about some MDAR grants, and then we're going to um, tour the farm and hand it over to Lee and Andrew. Lee is the farmer here at Food Bank. Um, so I think I've introduced everyone. So I want to start off talking with Andrew about how this land came to be APR. I know we had discussed that you weren't directly involved, but I just think that's an interesting story as it's all a little different. Sure. Well, welcome everyone to Food Bank Farm. I'm Andrew Morehouse, and this will be brief because as uh, you just heard, I don't know a lot about it. Uh, and other folks might be able to chime in, including Jerry, I think, had a role to play in it in some way. Um, he has some background knowledge. Uh, in any event, um, we purchased the farm uh, with the assistance of Kestrel Land Trust back in 2020. And there must have been at least a year, if not two years, of preparation for that. Uh, Kestrel Land Trust not only worked with us to purchase this farm, but also uh, Maple Lime Farms over there and the town of Amherst over there, who, when all was said and done, acquired portions of the farmland. This was the former Shala farm. So Maple Line Farm acquired about 28 acres and uh, the town of Amherst uh, acquired another 20 or so acres that became part of their existing conservation area that's off of 116. And we ultimately simultaneously purchased from Kestrel Land Trust when they purchased the, the land from the Shala family and acquired the, M the APR at the same time. Uh, and we own the rest of the land. 
So all I can tell you about the APR program is that um, Keschel did its homework, did it very well. I know among other things they had to obviously come up with an appraisal uh, and they needed to secure a local match, which I don't, I think it has to be a minimum of 10%, but maybe more. They actually, it was a, about 25%. They were able to persuade the town of Hadley through CPA funds, Community Preservation Act funds, to commit uh, $360,000 towards the purchase of this project, which totaled about $1.2 million. So there were a lot of other pieces that came into this, different, lots of different funding sources. But of course, um, an important piece of it was the APR. Uh, I don't know what term you like to restriction. use. Restriction. <laughs> well, it's restriction, but there was the, clearly there was a there was a financial benefit yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the the cost of the land, the purchase price of the land. So that's really all I can tell you. Uh, so I just want to really encourage you to. Uh, get the word out uh, that land trusts in the valley, whether it's Kestrel Land Trust or the Franklin County Land Trust or the Hilltown Land Trust, some more than others know a lot about how to work with MDAR to make uh, 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 you know, prime farmland uh, available in perpetuity uh, through the, the APR program. Yeah, and as a result of that, this APR, so an APR is permanent, and this land will only ever be available for farming and agricultural purposes. This APR is 142 acres, and the town of Hadley is a heavy user of the program in a very, very good way. They've got 100 APRs, about 3,400 acres. So what that means is that 21% of Hadley is under APR and is permanently protected forever for farmland. So I'll keep this part brief, but the program is 40 years old, so what that really means for farmers is that there's a lot of variability. The program has changed a lot over time, so th every document's a little bit different. This property here was protected with money from the state government, from Kestrel and the town, and Kestrel and the town pulled together a significant amount of money for this project. A partner we don't see on this um, property as far as funding goes, who helps us tremendously throughout the state, is the NRCS. They're our big funding partner, so a lot of the land in Massachusetts is protected with their help. So we've got in our portfolio land that has a federal restriction and land that has a state restriction. The biggest difference in those two is what you can and can't do on the properties um, and the monitoring schedule. Um, to that point, we've increased our stewardship staff significantly here in the APR program. For many, many years, it was just one singular staff member doing it all by herself, and that's 900 APRs that she was responsible for. Really not sustainable. So now there's five of us, which is great, and I'm gonna pull Nathan into the mix. So Nathan um, comes from a land trust world, and he really has his monitoring on lock, and so he's just gonna say a few words about how and why and what of the APR monitoring. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm Nathan Moyer. Um, my region is the northwest part of the state, so basically western Franklin County and northern Berkshire County. Um, but I'll talk just a little bit about why we monitor. Um, I think there are really two broad main reasons. Uh, the first is that it builds public trust in the APR program, um, you know, the public you know, the funds that are provided by the state um, really to protect these farms in perpetuity. When monitoring's happening, happening um, you know, the public's more confident that these properties will remain in active uh, commercial agricultural, you know, forever. Um, and the second piece is it gives the, the department and the program a chance to, um, you know, to interact with and meet regularly with our landowners and our farmers um, to build those relationships, to check in and get sort of a pulse on, um, you know, what activities are happening on the farms, different trends that we may be seeing, what the farmers' needs are, um, and it gives us as the stewardship planners a chance to um, have conversations about how we can connect them with various resources, whether they be grants or some of our other um, agricultural partners that may have programs that can assist them. So we use the monitoring um, as a chance to sort of touch in, and, and we we try to do it, you know, annually. Um, let's see. So that's those are broadly why we monitor. Um, and the monitoring, uh, we have a couple different ways we monitor. Um, anytime we monitor, we we usually start off by doing a desk review, which is looking at aerial photos, um, trying to understand like what's happening or what changes have happened from a land use perspective. 
Um, we look at the Massachusetts lands registry records to see, you know, what, if any, any changes or any recorded documents that are on a property. Uh, we look at social media, websites, just to get our head around what to expect with, with the farms that we're, we're going to be monitoring. Um, and then we have two different, two different ways we monitor. Um, one is with a phone call where we'll reach out to the landowner and ask a series of questions about um, and have a discussion about the, you know, what's happening at the farm, what their uses are, what their questions for us are. Um, and then once we're done with that phone call, we draft the report and we file that report and we offer it to the, the landowners as well. Um, and the other type of monitoring that we do is, um, is sort of with the site visit, where we get a chance to tour the properties, take some photos, meet, hopefully meet face to face with the farmers. Um, and which I think is, you know, my favorite way to be out uh, is seeing the property. I think you, it's, it's great to, uh, to do that. And I think it's certainly the, the best way to monitor when we can. But I think because of capacity, like Tina had said, we're, we're almost 1,000 APRs throughout the state. So we, we, can't, um, we can't get out on the ground to, to visit all the properties every year. So we do the, the phone calls, um, I think the majority of the year. With the on-site visits, we try to do, we try to do those at least once every five years. Um, and hopefully, hopefully more than that. Um, and then the other thing I'll say about monitoring is uh, we, like I said, we have five stewardship planners. Um, we do a lot of stuff outside of monitoring, so uh, we do have some contractors that we work with with the uh, Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissioners. Sort of, is that right? Um, but we have a handful of contractors that that help us do these monitoring, both the phone call stuff as well as some on-site ones. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that covers everything I wanted to say. Yeah, I think I'll segue that into monitoring is a really good opportunity to bend someone's ear about all the services MDAR has. Um, and then I think we could maybe transition into all the work NRCS has done on this property. Could I ask you a question before yes. that? Only because I've, it's come to my attention that and maybe you can expound on this, that not all AP, APRs are alike. Correct. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so back to the age of APRs, and I usually tell people there's two types of APRs, and you know which one yours is based on how frequently we're in contact with you. So the federally protected APRs have a requirement that we are in contact with those landowners once a year, um, and we're on the ground there once every five years. And time goes by so quickly that I've had a farmer say, you were here last year. I was like, no, that was five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so the differences can range. I think the differences are really all about the retained rights. So some of our oldest APRs have the opportunity to request a dwelling. Um, it's a very high bar to meet that. Um, all of our APRs allow for labor housing. Some of our old APRs allow for utility easements on properties. That's not really common on the newer APRs. Um, the newer APRs have been drafted to be more enforceable um, and because we've seen over time that the language just wasn't as clear in some of the older ones. The old documents maybe are three pages long. The new documents are more like eight or nine pages. And so you have just very, very specific language in there. But I'll say it's, it's really challenging working in perpetuity because there's things in those old documents like solar, for example, that wasn't really conceived as being something that's on the table. Um, so it's an evolving program and that's why everyone has different um, rights and so we, our hope is that our regulations and our policies kind of fill the gaps for people. Um, another thing that can differ amongst APRs is the language about sales and transfers. Mm -hmm. So some of our oldest APRs have no language about who an APR can be sold to, at what cost, or for what reason. Um, so as time evolved, we put in something called a right of first refusal, which allows MDAR to have a say in who buys the land. Um, time went by and we saw that that wasn't quite enough to keep the program to its original intent, which is for farming. Um, there is an affordability factor that is very, very challenging, and that's always on the forefront of our mind of, will this make a farm not affordable? So as time went on, we added something that was pioneering for Massachusetts. Um, we were the first ones to do this, called an option to purchase at ag value. So our newest APRs, this one included, has language in there that if you own this land and you go to sell it, we not only want to know who's going to buy it, 
Does their business plan look viable? Well, we want to see the sales price and why it is at that price. Um, we don't want to see something selling for development value because we've already paid the development value. That is what an APR is. It's us, the state, giving you the development value for your land and you retain the ag value. Now granted, in Hadley, ag value is very, very high. Um, so we've had people walk away from the APR program in Hadley because the value of the agriculture is so high. Um, I'm trying to think of what else differs. Um, the ability to grow marijuana differs by APR. You know, we recently reinterpreted the regs to allow for marijuana to be cultivated on non-federal APRs because those lands um, are not, they don't have a federal interest. Um, it, it wasn't really, I really thought when that changed we'd see more farmers going that route, but it wasn't, it didn't really make a bunch of difference in APR land. Um, this APR is unique in that they worked with Kestrel and everyone came to like so sort of compromise on land use so there was an easement granted right before it closed allowing Kestrel to have trail access through the land. That's not generally something we allow on APRs, a public trail through the land. So it's really another example of um, if you're looking to APR your land, you know, working with a land trust and just talking about what aspects you might want to see in that property after the deal closes and after you can't make any changes, that's really important. And I think those are the major changes, but I think if any other planner thinks I missed something, you can hop in. That's Thank you. Yeah, so one thing I wanted to point out is that on <coughs> this farm, um, they've had a lot of approvals requests. So approval requests on APR land is a pretty straightforward process. I will say if you know you're going to want to build something or even excavate something on your land, um, let us know early. The process can take as long as 90 days. But Food Bank and I have worked together and with my predecessor who worked on this property before me to put on five um, certificates of approval for the land. So utilities, wells, because this APR requires approval for wells, um, for this really nice structure right here. So that's another note on the stewardship angle. So our role as stewardship is really to monitor properties, check for compliance, and help people through the approval process. And I think to um, make sure people are up to speed on what we offer is part of the job as well. So um, the food bank farm has taken, uh, you know, part in some of our grant opportunities and I wanted to use the rest of this time if anyone does have any further questions to kind of have like a grants in the wild so talk about everything going on here and then there were some climate issues on the farm if we could fold that in too but um, we can kind of let you Andrew talk about certain things and then maybe me and Diego can hop in and say what those are. I also want to point out I put on the table a purple piece of paper that encompasses most of MDAR's grants and um, someone had asked about the timing of grants so our grants usually come out late winter early spring so sign up for our farm and market report that's the best way to stay in tune with all those grants and if you have any questions about those grants, now is a really good time or any time of year, call on the website the contact for that grant and just talk through it. Um, I really recommend you do that. And with NRCS, I recommend you just call them once a year to make sure um, you're getting the most up-to-date information and service from them. Cool. So, yeah, Tina mentioned the NRCS grant. Uh, and the and some other uh, MDAR funding, so maybe I'll do it in chronological order. In uh, 2022, if I'm not mistaken, the MDAR Food Security Infrastructure Grant came out for the first round, and we were fortunate enough to not only apply for one, but um, become awarded. Yeah? Sorry, I, I think it was 21. Was it 21? It was 20. 20. Was it really? <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> oh my gosh, see, five years of monitoring, 2020, <laughs> my gosh. Okay, uh, so we were, thanks for the correction. Uh, <laughs> we received a, uh, an FSIG grant and it mainly, it, it paid for bringing in electricity for three phase power because our long term goal is to put a solar array on the roof to generate electricity, not only for the greenhouses, but primarily for a cooler. We hope to acquire in future years. Uh, it, it paid for the renovation of the two barns, uh, the exterior and the roofing. And 
the greenhouses. Um, so those were the yeah, those were the three big ticket items. Uh, so we're extremely grateful for that. Uh, they are in operation now. I'll leave that to Lee to talk a little bit more about. And then the second uh, major investment we made was uh, thanks to NRCS through I believe it's an agricultural management assistance grant. Is it was AMA? It's an AMA grant. Uh, and that paid for an irrigation system uh, that has been installed and a pump uh, that uh, has been installed underground and the pump is way in the far end of the field you can just make out the, the <coughs> pump head over there uh, and it's uh, it's a very large pump uh, and it's a very uh, powerful pump and it essentially provides irrigation for all of the fields uh, on, on this side of the road and a chunk on that side as well and that was about a sixty thousand dollar grant it was uh, uh, stipulated to be micro irrigation and we gave it our best shot uh, but it uh, um, uh, we're, 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 we've negotiated a, a modification to that so we're grateful for the flexibility and um, uh, so now we have you know, our, the farmers who we lease the land to and I'll, I'll speak more about that later are very grateful that they have access to, to irrigation uh, to grow vegetables when it's dry like, me, like it is now that's about all I can say okay uh, <laughs> Diego do you want to talk a little bit about um NRCS AFT partnership sure. combo. Yep. Sure. Um, hey everyone, I'm Diego. Um, I'm formerly a farmer. Worked with, uh, got some MDAR grants. Worked with NRCS a little bit in my time farming. Um, I I worked for MDAR briefly uh, in my previous job, and now I work for American Farmland Trust AFT, um, and we work in close partnership with the NRCS. Um, and my region is, is Western Massachusetts. So I'll just give a little context and then maybe I can talk a little bit about what happened here. Um, so AFT is a national nonprofit that prom promotes uh, conservation and farm viability across the country. Um, I have a bunch of handouts on the table, um, no farms, no food bumper stickers, but hands out, handouts about what AFT does they have their hands in a lot of different things. You can get free soil testing. Um, they do a lot of policy work. Um, there's all sorts of programs that uh, AFT has its hands in. Um, but AFT has a contract with the NRCS um, to help get NRCS contracts completed, um, especially as they relate to climate solutions on farms. Um, so that's where my work comes in. So I'm an implementation specialist with, the NR with AFT and NRCS. Um, the NRCS, if you're not familiar, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, so I work closely with Manuel, who's the engineer who worked on this project. He asked me to come and just give a little spiel about how it works to work with NRCS. Um, so NRCS funds a range of practices related to addressing resource concerns, and they frame everything in that lens of addressing a resource concern. Um, some example of practices they fund are high tunnels. People, a lot of people know NRCS from the EQIP um, high tunnel program. Um, they'll pay for cover cropping, they'll pay for pest management, mm -hmm. livestock fencing, Irrigation is a really big one we see, especially these days with the effects of climate change. Um, wells, pipelines, drip, sprinklers, water reels, um, tillage reduction. There's a huge range of practices that NRCS will cost share for you as a farmer to implement. Um, there's a ton of money out there for this stuff, um, but some of the practices pay better than others. Some of them are better for the farmer than others. Um, some of them it's maybe not worth your time to do and some of them it really is worth your time and maybe it's something you were going to do anyways. Um, they frame it as a cost share, not a grant. Um, because they sort of estimate what this practice might cost, say to install a well, and then they pay 75 to 95 percent of that cost. Um, on a reimbursement basis. Um, I always tell folks that they shouldn't enter into a contract with NRCS unless you're pretty sure 
you know you want to do that thing um, because and you're clear what NRCS needs from you because there's timelines associated with the contracts um, and there's requirements you have to uh, complete in order to get paid for those items. Um, when you work with NRCS, you're responsible for completing the practices or communicating if you need an extension um, or a modification or, or you don't know how to do it. Um, we can help with that. That's part of my job. Um, work a lot with like folks who don't know how to install their irrigation and we help them get that up and running. Um, but you're really responsible for completing the practice if you're working with NRCS. Um, NRCS is slow. So if you want to work with NRCS or you think you might want to work with NRCS, you should call them now um, if you think you might want to work with them next year. Um, because it's, it's a bureaucracy, there's turnover, there's tons of paperwork, you have to get in the system with FSA. It just takes a long time. Um, so it's always good to call them early, even if you're not sure exactly what you want to do. Um, you don't need to... You don't need to craft a narrative to get in with NRCS like you do to apply for another grant program. You really just need to call them, talk about what your farm's needs are, and um, you know, start the process, do the paperwork, that sort of thing. Um, it's not applying in the way where you need to like really convince them. You just need to, like NRCS has an obligation to work with anyone who, who calls them if it's a good fit. Um, So I'm an implementation specialist. I have some farm experience. A lot of um, folks at NRCS don't have farm experience. So, so that's where we come in. We can help um, you navigate the NRCS world, um, steer you towards practices that are worth your time to do, um, and you know things like help you design your irrigation system. So here at Food Bank, um, I think Manuel helped you guys install a huge pipeline that you spoke to that goes along the road here. Um, so my understanding is they, they sort of got water in place here and now the farmers use their own irrigation equipment to run off the hydrants that uh, NRCS paid to install. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. And um, can I speak a little bit more yeah, to that? Go ahead. Only because you mentioned Manuel and I forgot to say it was a delight to work with Manuel. He is an amazing person and he knows a lot about um, <clears throat> wells in this area. In fact, he took it upon himself to kind of learn the best practices from the, the local well drillers who are, with every passing year, are, are moving on, let's just say. And mm -hmm. so he's, he's managed to capture that knowledge mm -hmm. uh, of shallow wells in, in the Pioneer Valley and, and discourage people from considering whether they're farmers or, well, whether they're farmers to, um, you know, drill a, a deep well because in the valley you don't need to so you can if you if you find the right place and that's part of the, the art and the science of it you can uh, drill a, a shallow well at a fraction of the cost uh, and he can help you determine how to how to what is it test the well or develop develop the well <laughs> develop the well properly so that it's a fully functioning well and you get the highest uh, gallons per minute and we got about 60 gallons per minute he helped design the well and he found a, a, a competitive contractor who, who did the job for us. In our case, uh, we went over our over budget uh, because we, you know, just delays. So we ended up having to uh, dig trenches and you know in the in the winter months, which added to the cost. And so you you never know what's going to happen. But it, we knew going into it with our eyes wide open that it, that was a, a potential risk. But other than that, it was a pretty easy program I mean as you, despite everything all the warnings you're saying it wasn't it wasn't really hard uh, believe me I've worked on hard grants mm -hmm. or cost sharing partnerships yeah and, and this wasn't hear. one yeah I think I just like to tell folks up front that it's there's a lot of yeah. administrative stuff there's a lot yeah. of paperwork you got to go through the steps of the process and it was great he and other folks at NRCS and AFT go above and beyond to help make sure these projects are successful um, and from my from my time farming, whenever whenever I talk to farmers who are considering working with NRCS, I say you should because if I had known how much money there was out there for things I wanted to do anyways, I would have been all over this when I was farming. Um, NRCS, I think, is a great um, resource for farmers. So.
Is there an ongoing uh, application process? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So they do funding rounds uh, regularly every few months. Um, so if you're interested, just, just get in touch as soon as you are interested and sort of get into their system. Because again, there's, you know, it takes some time to get in. But yeah, it's rolling. I mean, I think they're done for this year. Honestly, it's a little arcane to me how the funding all works, but it's rolling, basically. Thank you. What are your like, top five NRCS things that they'll pay for that people could really benefit from? Um, irrigation is a really big one. Irrigation is expensive, and NRCS pays well to do irrigation. Um, they pay for cover cropping. Um, especially if you haven't been cover cropping and you want to start. Um, equip. Fencing. Yeah, so there's different, there's some fencing. So there's equip and there's CSP and there's AMA. I don't want to get into the, all the different programs. That's like, to, you know, that's just whatever they're going to call the contract. But either way, it's a contract with NRCS. They also work with like fo people who have forest land to do a, a forest management plan to do some maintenance on your forest. Um, yeah, there's a lot out there and, and the rates are better. The rates change when it's a smaller farm. So acknowledging that it's sort of a different scale. Um, they might pay you better or they'll pay you by the square foot to do cover cropping if your farm is less than two acres. I made up that number, but <laughs> something like that. Um, instead of paying a lower rate, which is by the acre, which works for the really big farms, um, but they sort of adjust things to the small farmers. One other thing I forgot to mention, I remember before we even were awarded the, the uh, MA grant from NRCS, we had someone from NRCS come out and they prepared a conservation plan. A conservation yes. plan. Is that a prerequisite for NRCS funding or was that? Yeah, so a conservation plan yeah. is just, once you get in their system, a planner will come out and do a site visit with you. And based on that, they'll generate a conservation plan. It's usually a very basic document. It just says kind of like what you're interested in doing, what some of the issues are on your farm. Um, if you have a, a livestock farm, they'll do a grazing plan, which you know will account for the numbers and what they think maybe you could do different and then they'll fund you to do those things differently. So. And I remember that triggered, you know, then there are other people get into the mix or other departments that triggered the Department of Fish and Wildlife, I think, because we had to get a certification that there were no endangered species mm. on the program. Yep. So yeah, I think there's some, there's some crossover. Yeah. I mean, NRCS itself is not a regulatory agency, so they're not regulating anything. Um, but others do. Others do. <laughs> the, just to speak to that, the triggering fish and wildlife or other agencies would only be specific to certain land that maybe has um, areas where there is the habitat. Uh, habitat, yeah, yeah, yeah. for In critical case, species we have, areas. We have wetlands here. You know, part of the APR is all the woodlands that you see around you is part of the APR. Mm -hmm. Were you going to say something, Sonia? Oh, I was just saying drainage is another program that. Uh, we don't think about it in a dry year like we're experiencing now, but last year um, we were thinking about that a lot. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. So that would be another practice that NRCS would support. Yep. yep. Potentially. Potentially. <laughs> that one's tricky. So that's a yeah, drainage is a tricky area. So which are the ones that, you, that come to mind that are the most highly reimbursed? There's literally like 800 practices, so mm -hmm. that's kind of hard to name. But some of them, I would say, the reimbursement rates are so good that they're basically paying you to do it. They'll pay you more because they've just, that's how they estimated the cost. Um, you know, maybe to put low tunnels on your farm and do insect netting. For small farms, the rate is really good for that. So folks are basically getting paid to install that. Whereas there's other practices where maybe their, their cost estimate is out of date and you know, they want to pay you um, $10,000, they calculated, to put in an access road, and your contractor's telling you 20000 And it's like, NRCS can't adjust it just because your contractor said it's more. Um, it's just, it's sort of a game of like figuring out what's going to be worth it to you, and it's, it's context-specific to the farmer as well. Maybe you 
know how to, like maybe you can install something yourself. Um, if you can build your high tunnel, you don't have to pay labor to do that, or you don't have to like outsource it, then you're gonna save money doing that. Um, NRCS is gonna pay you X amount no matter what, no matter who builds it, um, which I know is different than some of the MDAR grants want us, they wanna see a little more like verification that maybe a contractor did it. Um, and that reminds me, the one other piece I wanted to mention is that a lot of the MDAR grants ask on the application if you have a conservation plan, which basically just means you've called NRCS, they've come out to your farm and you've started working with them. Um, so they give you, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they, they sometimes give a few more points on an application um, if you're already working with NRCS. Uh, I just want to add to that too. Um, so hi, I'm Matthew. I work for the local conservation district. I'm also a conservation planner for NRCS, and so I'm still trying to learn about some of that. But just the payment rates and stuff of and the practices they're supporting is not set in stone. It can be variable. Um, so this year they're starting to put more support towards agroforestry practices, which is kind of newer for NRCS, um, and they're kind of developing the systems for that. So each year might look different, similar to the APR program there's a lot of variability from year to year and over time. And as part of my job with the conservation district, we kind of serve in between NRCS and the community. So if there's practices that NRCS is currently not supporting, like I would encourage farmers to reach out to the conservation district and we're supposed to voice that to NRCS and that's supposed to help inform their uh, development of programs moving forward and services. Um, and you know, some of that could take time, but Payment rates can also vary depending on, like historically underserved producers would get a higher percentage rate for uh, certain practices than other farmers too. But just to emphasize, like a lot of things, like agroforestry is tricky because as Diego said, like you need a resource concern. They need to see something and that can be really broad. Like high tunnel is somehow addressing a resource concern. It's just called plant productivity because you want a longer growing season. Um, but with some of the agroforestry, that can be kind of a holdup because it's what's identifying what your resource concern is if you just have trees with animals grazing through them. That's all for me. Nice. Um, Andrew, you would, um, I'll give you a minute. So I wanted nope. to go through. <laughs> okay. I'm just taking notes. <laughs> Did anyone have any other questions for me? Did you? No. Uh, is, are there any chances that NRCS maybe in the future mm -hmm. would pay for the building of high tunnels or low tunnels? Pay for the construction? Yeah. Um, so it is factored into the payment rate. Because usually a lot of farmers yeah, run into timing it. issues. Like, you know, I got to get this thing up in a month. Yeah, I, I mean, so <laughs> NRCS technically in the current payment rates, they do account for labor costs. Now, We've seen in the last like three, four years, the cost of steel and all materials has skyrocketed. Yeah. So I think that's why, you know, they still might only pay you 20,000 for your large high tunnel, and maybe it costs you 22 or something, and that's you building it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but technically, when they did the cost estimate that they got the number, 20,000, they did factor in labor. So yeah, like Matthew was yeah, saying, like these costs can change year to year. Um, NRCS periodically updates the payment rates. I wanted you to mention your DEP grant that you got for coolers, because I that's one that um, I kind of forget about, and it's very useful for sure, farmers. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's a the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection grant. I can't remember what it was actually called, uh, but it was for high efficiency coolers. And we were awarded fifty thousand dollars towards the purchase of that. Um, we still have some funding to raise, uh, but it will ultimately go in that barn, be connected, obviously, to electricity, hopefully a solar array, uh, and it will provide us with the capacity we need uh, to to be able to store vegetables not only that are grown on this uh, farm that Lee will talk about, or this initiative of the larger farm. But as we evolve, we have a <clears throat> an incubator model, uh, and so we're lease continuously going to be leasing more and more land to emerging our new farmers, including Benito Torres, who's here, uh, and his family. Uh, <laughs> and so they, they're our first farmer here, and we hope to 
to see that continue to grow uh, over the years because we have more available land here. Uh, since, since the APR program um, invested in this farm, we bought five additional acres that honestly were nestled within this farm but owned by someone else. So we've acquired those and are cleaning them out for organic growing. And, but they are not part of the APR, but that's okay because nobody can develop them because there's no access. So there you have it. Perfect. Yeah. Did you say that was from the Department of Environmental Protection? It was indeed. Yeah. And all types of entities uh, were awarded that funding, including, among other things, Big Y Supermarket. So big and small. And you said you're still raising funds for that? So we are. It like a cost share thing? No, it wasn't a cost share. We just, uh, you know, of course we would have uh, appreciated and welcomed the, the full cost of the, of the proposal, which would have covered the full cost, but they didn't see it that way. That's fine. We'll, 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 we'll raise it. Mm -hmm.